continuing to talk about linear second order systems here, consider as an example the classical mass spring damper system. It's forced here, so it's got a forcing F of T. Here's a simple model here. When we take the system, here's ZV in your vertical variable here, there's no gravity shown here, but again, that's just another input that you could deal with. Um, you divide by m and you define your 2 zeta omega n, classical form. Here now, note that what you'd have to do when you divide by m, you'd multiply and divide by k. Why do you do that? And it's so that you can actually get omega n squared on this side and put it into the standard form. When you do that, now this becomes your u of t as shown here. Okay. Again, this is just an approach that we like to use. Uh, it makes it very easy now to identify what is your u naught value, and then you can use that in your forced input relationships that we'll look at later. But now see how your damping ratio is defined, your undamped natural frequency, and remember the natural period. Note that you can also express natural frequency, undamped natural frequency, and again, this should be undamped natural period. And I'm very careful to make sure to say this because there is a damped natural frequency that is the frequency that you actually measure in a system because you always inherently have some damping in there. See how the, the, the frequency of a system is always going to depend on its damping. Something important to remember and I'd like to emphasize that for that reason. So like if you use that log, de log decrement approach, Inherently, it has any measurements going to have the damping Im implicit. Good. Let's look at this example problem, and I'm really just going to give a description of the problem statement and show you how it ends up being a second order system. Uh, we have a f fishing boat, say, that's being pulled by a large tugboat. So the tugboat is specifying this velocity right here. And um, the tow cable, we're going to model it as linearly elastic. And and when we say that it elongates, say, a certain amount for every thousand pounds, think about what that says. It says you have some delta x or some applied force. And for every elongation or a different force, right, you're, you can make an assumption that that gives you a linear relation, thus you have a defined k, right? Also going to give a certain value to drag force along the boat here. So really, if you think about it, you could draw a little schematic and even model this thing with some V, mass, stiffness, velocity. Very simple system in this way, right? And what we're going to do is, you know, give some step here. Known length of cable, maybe. Because uh, that can affect things, too. All right. So the boat starts moving with a constant velocity at time t equal to zero. So, again, you could model that as a step input. In reality, you know, that tugboat probably starts off and then gets there. But we might we might say that... We're going to say that that's a short delta t before it gets to constant value and model it as a step. So let's say we want to solve for the tug and the boat velocity. Well, we know the tug velocity, um, so we don't have to solve for that. We want to solve for the boat velocity, maybe position also, the travel distance of both. Maybe how much the cable extends. Starts off with this initial length L. And then also, what is the force in, in the cable? And then also, how much force is putting, being put on that boat? And um, what we do is we begin describing this. As you can see, you've got a K, you've got an M, and a B. And uh, it's an interesting problem because then you can start changing the parameters. You can say, hey, what if I change the length of this cable? What do you think that would do to the stiffness? Right. So this K... Does it, does it depend on length? 
Well, there's not enough information here, but you have to think about, well, that's a cable. You know, that's some length of cable. It's got some thickness and some length. You have to think back to your basic mechanics of solids, and you may not remember, but you can actually show that the stiffness of a, this has a certain area, and I say this has a Young's modulus, you can actually show that the stiffness is Ea over L. Okay, so if I, so that I say if, if, if I double the length, what does that do to K? Sorry, this K is, is K here of the cable. Length of the cable, area, Young's modulus. So, well, what happened also is, what does that do? What we want to do, though, is look at how it influences omega and, and, and zeta, right? So that's a problem that we usually look at. If you put this now into a normalized, you know, standard form, you can look at how the response changes given different parameters. The other thing is the cable is always assumed to be, as we might say, you know, taut. In other words, not slack. What happens to this cable if you try to push it? So here's you know, here's tension. What if you're in compression? What does the force look like when you're in compression? You know, say it's linear in this direction, according to these characteristics, right? It stretches so much for a certain amount of force. What happens in compression? What is the force? This is a problem that I might throw at you as part of a homework set. Let's look at another problem that can be uh, tackled using concepts from linear second order systems. Let's say we had some system that had uh, that was a description of a of, of, of a force measurement system, but we were going to measure the force by actually putting a sensor here that could measure the position of the mass. Right, so one type of sensor that does that, and you can look this up, it's a linear variable differ di differential transformer or LVDT sensor that measures position. So what we want to do is take a, a measurement from, from this guy, a measurement of position, and from that infer force. How would we do that? Well, we model the system as a second-order system. Show that Z, right, second-order system. You can show that it takes a second-order system form, etc. And then you can uh, follow certain specifications. So look at the specification. We want the measurement response should that it should be fast enough and also, you know, within a certain amount of time, which means you don't want it to be oscillating forever and you don't want it to have a lot of overshoot, okay? So given the model, which I haven't shown you here because I'm assuming that you could show that this is a second order system, you know, mass spring damper system, but now you could apply some of these principles from an under damp system. The fact that you're saying small overshoot means you don't want it to be critically damped or over damped because you want it to be fast yet have small overshoot. So it means that you can allow it to overshoot a little bit. So we're going to define a settling time using what? Remember the envelope time constant? So you see by using the settling time specification you could say okay I'm gonna I want that to be 0.01 seconds so that allows you to find this guy here. Once you know this value this this specification by the way for time constants means that you want it to be to within 2% of the steady value in 0.01 seconds. Now you can use that to find, right, two, 2 times that is equal to 800. So now you've got a relationship between B and M, okay? So you, you're going to have to be given something. To have a small overshoot, you choose now that your zeta is going to be, remember that design value I told you about. Minimal overshoot, fastest response. 
Now we're going to specify a mass of 100 grams, and now you can begin finding values for K and for B. All right. So I'm going to just step through this. Again, another nice little problem that you can use to illustrate basic second order response. In this case, um, you know, if you were designing it as a underdamped or even a critically damped system, you use different formulas based on your response calculations. Finally, I wanted to show you uh, another model of a system uh, that shows you that, again, a second order system doesn't always have to be so obvious uh, as to be made up of, you know, the typical I, R, and C elements. You know, here you have, you know, a model of uh, field excited mo DC motor. See, here's the motor characteristic. Let me blow this up a little bit so you can see it better. See, you got a, the motor. There's Note that I don't have, why don't I have any resistance here or any inductance? Why don't I care about that? Well, the reason is that I'm actually driving this with a current. So that means that, remember how every electric motor, the torque that you generate here is R of that motor times the current. So if I specify current in this loop with a source, as I'm doing here, then I know that guy. I don't need to know anything about, I mean, putting on a resistor in there is not going to change that. So I don't, uh, unless I need to know what the voltage drop is across this whole thing, because then it might limit this. But if I'm just treating it as an ideal source, then I don't need to put anything else in there. Okay. Note that instead of being like a permanent magnet DC motor, where the field and the motor was a magnet, and so it was a constant R, now I have this field here that's specifying that. So the modulation here is not constant. And sorry, the 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 parameter is not constant, which means it's it's modulated. Okay, it's a modulated G. So you're gonna have to look back at lesson. Sorry, in module four and a discussion of modulation. But I'm gonna show you the bond graph. Okay. See here. So that here's your field circuit for the DC motor. Here's here's this current source going through the gyrator. So note that this R, and I can put a little M here if I like, uh, it's a function of the field current. So you have a circuit up here, right? And note this modulation, okay? And now I've got this other, this this is the model for the torque, you know, with the little flywheel. Here's the, DC, the the series circuit, and they're connected only through this information flow, okay? So note, now I have flow in, torque out, that gives me that causality, so I have one state there. On the, on the field circuit, I have voltage in. Remember, no causality on this guy. But now I have integral causality here, so I have another state, and then there. Okay, so I have two states, right? Lambda F and H, second order system. But that's not in standard form. Now you could go and put this into a simulation, whatever it's, it's but if it's all, all linear system, let's put that into second order form, okay? So let's move over here. First, derive your state equations. There's your H. H dot is the difference in the torques. Okay. Let me see if I can get both of them. It's going to be hard for me to get, I'm going to shrink that down. There you go. Um, see the H dot here is just the difference in T minus TB. And you can come up with this equation here. Remember, you have to use the, the motor torque. To, see how the motor torque TM is going to bring in the field current and the current, both of those currents together. Well, that looks kind of complicated here because you've got an input here times out of state. So that's not a linear circuit, right? Okay, not linear. However, if you make this current 
be constant and only the voltage that you're changing in the field, then if I naught is a constant, now that's a parameter and it's no longer nonlinear. Okay? So that means you get linear, linear equations. Now the equation for lambda f comes from this from this bond graph here. It's very simple. Lambda dot is V minus the voltage across the resistor. And you get this equation here. So you have equation one and equation two. Okay. So now we've got the state equations. Let's convert that into what second order form. I take this equation, the first one, differentiate it once. See, h double dot. And so now I'm going to get a derivative of lambda dot. Note that i naught here is a parameter now. And h dot is differentiated. Now where do I get this lambda dot f? Well, that's my second equation, right, here. Substitute that in there. And then, and then from, from this... Uh, Original equation for, where is it, uh, you know, here I can solve for lambda f in terms of h dot. Substitute all that in there. I'm going to let you fuss with this algebra, but you can show at the end of the day, get a nice little, here's your double derivative. Here's your first term, second term, and so here's your definition of 2 zeta omega n. There's your omega n squared, and then you can define your input term. So a little exercise, identify the damping ratio, identify the undamped natural frequency, and the normalized input. But as you can see, a system that's seemingly very complex can be shown to be a nice linear second order equation. And now all of the methods that we've talked about in terms of the solutions uh, are applicable to this problem.